King of Liberty. The National Broadcasting Company presents another in a special series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. There was free talk in the old New England town hall and around the Cracker Barrel in the Crossroad store. And there's free talk by free men every week at this time on the air, led by our host, Rex Stout. Many of you already know Rex Stout as the creator of Nero Wolf, criminologist extraordinary. On this program, you will get to know him even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy, Mr. Stout. Thank you, Dick Dudley. Good evening, friends of liberty. One of the inherent virtues of our democracy is the obligation it imposes on us to learn to get along with people we don't like. Well, we don't like the Nazis. Could we, in case they won their war and controlled three continents and all the oceans, could we nevertheless manage to get along with them? Millions of us are inclined to say no, simply because that's the way we feel about it. But very few of us are qualified to give a considered opinion based on actual knowledge and experience, and one of those few is our guest today. In 1924, Douglas Miller was our trade commissioner in Berlin. Throughout the administrations of Coolidge and Hoover and Roosevelt, he continued to represent us in the German capital, being commercial attaché from 1925 to 39. Resigning and coming home, he accepted an appointment as assistant professor of economics at the School of Commerce, University of Denver. Also, he wrote a book, which was published recently and is now a national bestseller. The title is, You Can't Do Business with Hitler. Since he was the official representative of American business in Germany for 15 years, six of them while the Nazis were running things, he ought to know. You did try to do business with him, didn't you, Mr. Miller? I certainly did, Mr. Stout. You didn't merely make a snap judgment because you didn't like him. By no means. I tried my best for years. I formed conviction slowly and with reluctance under the pressure of overwhelming evidence. The evidence came not only from the daily details of my job, but also from my close association with the Nazi leaders, from a detailed study of Nazi books, pamphlets, and newspapers, from the very beginning of their movement, when they were less cautious about discussing ultimate objectives. Well, if you had to sum up in one sentence the reasons why we can't do business with Nazi Germany, how would you put it? One sentence? Let's see. Because modern business is carried on by contract, and we can't make contracts with them. Why not? Because they'd be worthless. Hitler himself has stated that truth is anything that will help the German cause. And so naturally, it changes from day to day. Everything in Germany is run on that basis. Apply it to a business contract, and where are you? Well, did you actually encounter any applications of it to business contracts? Constantly. As an example, we had a commercial treaty with Germany guaranteeing equal treatment with other countries. One day, I visited the foreign office to protest about unfair discrimination against American exports of lard. The German official denied that any discrimination existed. He said that our quota was 40% of a three-year average, and so was every other country's. I confronted him with the text of a secret agreement by which Denmark was getting 65% to our 40%. He was hardly embarrassed at all. He nodded and said that's the way things were done nowadays. That was the reaction of a high official of the German government when I caught him in a flat lie and when his government signature on our commercial treaty had been flagrantly dishonored. What about German businessmen? Does the government keep its contract with them? It may or it may not in any given case. In practice, there are no rights left in Germany, neither civil rights nor property rights. When government officials can deprive a man of his liberty and even his life whenever they happen to feel like it, it makes no difference whether he has a title to his property or not. An official merely suggests that a gift of a certain sum is in order and the hint doesn't have to be repeated. Even such giants as Krupp and the United Steelworks didn't have to be told twice that it would be a good idea to turn over some of their most valuable coal mines and ore properties to the Hermann Goering Works. Now, you might call that a new kind of contract, contract by threat. Do they ever use it with non-Germans? Oh, yes, if and when required. An American firm that operated a large plant in the Rhineland shipped a lot of machinery from their German factories to Brazil. That violated no German law. But the Nazis threatened to jail every American in Germany connected with the firm unless the parent company in the United States sent a large sum of money to Germany. The money was sent. Another American firm owns a plant in Berlin, which now, under government orders, is making tiny hidden microphones to be placed in ordinary telephone receivers and connected with the Bureau of the Secret Police. When the American president of the firm visited Berlin to see what was happening to his stockholders' property, he wasn't even allowed to enter the plant. When he complained to me, all I could do was to point to the motto on the wall of my office. What was the motto? I had clipped it from an editorial in a newspaper, Hitler's paper, the Folkische Beobachter. I remember the date. 
August 3rd, 1936. It said, Justice and good nature should be limited to one's own people. I framed it and hung it on my wall as a reminder of what I was up against in my efforts to get justice and fair dealing for American businessmen. Not that I should have needed a reminder. Back in 1931, more than a year before the Nazis came to power, Goering told our embassy he would like to discuss economic policies with one of us. And I had lunch with him and talked all afternoon. He told me that all American business firms had better get out of Germany. He said the Nazis regarded the economic life of the country as a living organism, and that the presence of foreign firms inside their territory was like that of destructive bacteria in the human body. They set up an inflammation or irritation. Naturally, if the Nazis should win the war, they would extend that policy to all the world under their control. Yeah, the, con the three continents and all the oceans. But granting that Americans couldn't own or run any businesses inside their world, how about doing business with them on some other basis than a contract basis? What other basis is there? Well, a direct exchange of commodities, clearing agreements, barter. Did you ever negotiate a clearing agreement with a Nazi, Mr. Stout? I have not. Don't try. Not even if you're a sovereign government, let alone a mere businessman trying to make a decent and honest deal. One year, the government of South Africa, under pressure from their own wool growers, sold the entire wool clip to Germany against the future delivery of German locomotives, automotive equipment, and similar commodities. They delivered the wool, and time passed. They got excuses, but no goods. Nevertheless, on renewed German promises, the next year's wool clip went the way of the first, and a year later, the third one went. That finished it. Germany had obtained the wool, had made uniforms for her army, and the South Africans were still whistling for something in return. Well, I doubt if the Nazis could swindle Americans like that. Maybe not, but they think they can. In a moment of candor, a foreign office official once said to me, instead of dealing with the United States, we would like to deal with different areas, treating them as separate countries. We would not do much business with the country of New York, but would take cotton from the country of New Orleans and return finished goods. We would take fruit and lumber from the country of San Francisco and pay with manufactured goods. In the country of Chicago, we would exchange manufactured goods for packing house and agricultural products. Ouch, that's a bright idea. They intend to unify Europe and Africa and Asia and divide America. They do if that fellow knew what he was talking about, and he usually did. Have they made a start at it? They can't as long as the British Navy and ours control the oceans. But before the war, for example, the Germans put a maximum price of six cents a pound on United States cotton, while at the same time they were buying cotton from Latin America, Africa, and Asia at nine to ten cents a pound. They did that to divert trade from us and weaken us. Well, what about barter? Have you had any barter experience with the Nazis? I should say I have. I suppose I've seen more negotiations for barter deals than any other American. It would take hours to recite the difficulties we encountered. The German government imposed rules and regulations that made it almost impossible to arrange a deal. The usual barter ratio insisted upon was three to one. What does that mean? Well, here's an illustration. American walnut growers tried to arrange a barter of $100,000 worth of walnuts, but found they would have to buy $300,000 worth of German burlap bags and barbed wire in exchange. That meant that the walnut growers would have to invest $200,000 in cash and hope to get it back by selling the bags and the wire in the United States. That sounds as if the Nazis didn't want to do any business at all. No, that wasn't it. It is their settled policy always to try a squeeze, and often it works. When we think that an American company has been making more than half of all the passenger automobiles in Germany, that another is building the Red Cross ambulances for the army, that still another has 20,000 filling stations beside other large properties, that a number of other important United States firms have many millions of dollars invested in plant and equipment, we can understand that they are peculiarly subject to pressure and threats from Nazi quarters. Well, then the Nazis haven't kicked all the Americans out. Not yet. They've got another idea. Allow certain Americans to maintain their title to property in lands under Nazi control, but subject them to threats of punishment and confiscation and promises and inducements for good behavior. In that way, Hitler expects to apply strong pressure right inside the United States. Every business deal carries with it political and military implications. Do you know of any other instances, Mr. Miller? Many. Here's one. In 1938, Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda arranged for the president of the German film chamber to pay me a call. He proposed that American motion picture companies should sell their films in Germany for what they could get take their profits out of the country without restriction. 
In return for that privilege, Goebbels demanded the right to one quarter of the playing time of the largest picture theater in each of our 25 largest cities for German propaganda pictures. Yeah, he didn't want much. To you, maybe. He seemed to think it was a reasonable demand. I couldn't even convince the propaganda ministry that the United States government had no power to compel theater owners to display any particular pictures. Those fellows not only do not want free enterprise in a free country, they don't even believe it can exist. That same year, Goebbels told our embassy that he was pained by insults offered to Hitler in the American press and radio broadcasts, and he proposed a method of dealing with the problem. We were to select some Nazi journalist or radio broadcaster whom we disliked, and Goebbels would arrest him and punish him in any way we suggested. Then he would select some American journalist or broadcaster. Uh, you get the idea. It's incredible, literally incredible. To you, maybe. To us, it was just another headache. The fact is, Mr. Stout, that a citizen of a free country can't realize what totalitarian minds and methods are like until he lives among them for a long time. I'd rather stay ignorant, thank you. But I do want your opinion on this. Granted that the Nazis made it impossible to do business with them before the war, what if they win the war? I happen to be convinced they can't win, but what if they do? Do you think there's any chance that we could then do business with them? I do not. Why not? What if they change their methods? It isn't a question of method. It's their basic attitude toward all the rest of the world. Their doctrine of racial superiority, their leadership principle, their violent hatred of democracy and Christianity. Above all, perhaps, their conviction that war is a normal status of society, that peace is only a breathing spell between wars, a time of preparation for the next one. That is a primary item in the Nazi creed. Hitler can't possibly stop fighting as long as there's anyone left in the world who has not submitted to him. The Nazis simply wouldn't know how to act in a world of peace. But say they defeat Britain and we decide to try our best to do business with them. What would happen? That depends. Are you supposing that we would retain our civil liberties and our system of free enterprise? Yes, otherwise it wouldn't be us. Then it wouldn't work. Why not? Because it wouldn't. A million reasons. Take so simple a matter as the exchange of telegraphic messages over ocean cables, with one end in a free country and the other in a totalitarian dictatorship. Half of the messages we sent would never get delivered. How would we prevent Hitler from using the cables to force an entry into our internal affairs? Set up a censorship? There goes our free country. Remember, all of Europe and Africa and Asia would be under totalitarian control. What about the exchange of letters, newspapers, magazines, books, packages? Our government would have to control foreign trade, would therefore have to control movements of foreign exchange. In doing that, would have to open all first-class mail to see if it contained money. The protection of Americans abroad. Consider the millions in this country who have relatives and close friends on the other side. What about the billions of dollars worth of American property overseas? And a thousand other matters, all of which can be properly handled only when there's at least a moderate amount of good faith and common honesty on both sides. I could give you many other reasons if there were time. I'm sorry there isn't, Mr. Miller. You certainly have convinced me of one thing. If we did try to do business with a victorious Hitler, you wouldn't accept an appointment as commercial attaché, would you? I would not, and I would pity anyone who did. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is Douglas Miller, recently commercial attaché at the United States Embassy in Berlin and author of that revealing and informative book, You Can't Do Business with Hitler. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You've just heard the 17th of a special series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring John Tunis to the microphone. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed free to anyone requesting it. Please address your letter or card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has been presented as a public service by NBC and the independent radio stations associated with the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.